All right. Well, it is 7.34 p.m. It is Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021. Uh, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Present. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Revelack. Here. Good to have all of you here. Um, from the town, uh, Rick Valorelli, our board administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, sir. Uh, and Mr. Lee will not be joining us this evening. Um, and as always, our uh, legal consultant, Paul Haverty. Paul, good to have you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <clears throat> This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provision of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirements to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video webinar via the Zoom webinar application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is, will be broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials have been provided. Members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. We bring up our agenda. So this, after the reading of the remote participation details, which is just done, the only other item is number two, which is the continuation of the deliberation on the final decision for the Thorndike Place project. So turning to the comprehensive permit for Florendike Place, at its October 20th, 2021 public hearing, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place. This marked the end of the acceptance of testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40-day period for the board to consider and render its decision. On October 28th, 2021, the board initiated its deliberations. At the end of that session, the board voted to continue to this evening, November 3rd. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly, but the board is unable to accept comment from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, the town, or the public. For this reason, tonight's meeting is being conducted using the webinar platform, which allows the board to limit who may participate in the discussion. On behalf of the board, I appreciate everyone's understanding. The board will resume its discussions using the draft decision available on tonight's agenda. It can be differentiated by the text in the footer noting an October 28 revision. The board will quickly review the revisions proposed at the previous meeting, then resume the discussion with section two, C2 of the conditions discussing the proposed revisions. And at the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting to continue its deliberations. Under state regulations, the board must issue a decision by November 30th or request an extension from the applicant to further continuous deliberations. So with that, I will go ahead and share. So this is what we had at the end of last time. So let me actually, we started last time with I believe we finished through C1 and uh, would pick up on C2. Yeah. Were there any questions about the, the revised draft, the 1028 based on our conversations from last time, either in the waivers or in sections A, B, or C1? Mr. Chairman, I did have a couple of questions as I was reading it over. Yes, please. So I'm actually going to go, I made notes on another version. So in um, 
I have to scroll back up, bear with me. In C1, um, scrolling down, uh, C1D at the end, the last paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just curious, and if we did have this conversation, I apologize that I don't recall, but I was looking at a couple of things in this last paragraph, just above E. And one of them is that it's going to be annually for a three year period after completion of the plantings, the applicant, et cetera, shall remove and replace. Um, I'm just wondering, because I was trying to conceptualize how that works. I mean, completion of plantings, will that be at the end of the completion of the project itself and at the time that the certificate of occupancy is issued or would it be sooner? And the reason I ask the question is if the planting somehow were gonna be uh, completed in advance of the completion of the project overall, I'd have a concern that there could be, for instance, damage to some of those plantings in the course of the construction. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know whether or not, you know, the completion of plantings was contemporaneous with the completion of the project, in which case I think it's fine as is. But again, if they're gonna be finished, the plantings would be finished uh, in advance or far in advance of the project. I might wanna consider putting in that it's completion of the project uh, or issuance of a certificate of occupancy, whichever is later. And so, but I, I don't recall a conversation about, you know, how that timeline actually works. I don't know if anyone has any sense of how that would work. It's a very good question. I'm pretty sure this is the same language we had from 1165R. Um, And we could cert we could either change the phrase, you know, after completion of plantings to after issuance of certificate of occupancy. That at least gets us to the latest date possible. And I think I'd prefer to see that myself. Okay. How about after completion of plantings or the issuance of the Certificate of occupancy, whichever is later. Yes. And then in the next sentence, um, tell me when you're ready. I don't want to talk yep. over you doing that. Okay. Uh, so where it says applicant shall remove and replace any dead failing or, or any dead or disease plantings. Later on, you use the word, um, and it is down in, I think it's F, uh, small Roman numeral six. And there's a reference to dead and failing plantings. And when I first read this sentence, it says where it says dead or diseased, I mean, you can certainly have failing and you can have damaged and those don't necessarily equate to dead <laughs> or diseased. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to get, you know, too, into the minutia, but since you did use failing down or someone used uh, failing down below, I'd, I'd wanna see something like remove any dead failing or diseased plantings. Mr. Chair, I think Mr. DuPont may be referring to C1F. That's rather correct. than yeah. I'm just going to switch the draft that we're looking at to the the word file that I have been working on, just because I can then slip things in here. Um, so annually for a three year period after completion of plantings or the issuance of the certificate of occupancy, whichever is later. Let's see the first one. And then the applicant shall remove and replace any dead, failing, or diseased plantings. And trees serving as screening. Oh, okay. Got it. 
And then if no one else has a comment on that, there is something that also caught my eye in F, in, uh, you know, F2 and 3. Yeah, I'm just going to go over here, dead, and make Sorry. this identical language again. So dead, comma, failing. I'm sorry, where were you? Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just, wouldn't it be or diseased? Nope. Rather? <laughs> okay, Roger, where were you? So I'm sorry, I was, I went, I'm going down and C1 again to F. Yeah. Um, and, and actually above that in E, it talks about uh, vegetation being maintained, but I was trying to connect when I got to F, um, where it's in two, it says with at least a three-year vegetation monitoring schedule with an 80% rate. I I'm looking at the main paragraph that in F, and I don't see any actual reference um, to vegetation necessarily. And so my question in two is what vegetation is being monitored? What is that actually referring to? So the flood storage area does get planted. Um, but it says with regard to vegetation removal and grading, and, but it, it's not making a reference to planting unless it's somewhere else and I just missed it. But again, my question is in two, what vegetation is being monitored where it says three-year vegetation monitoring? Right, well, the next line, the next one, sub three is only native non-cultivar species that will be planted on the site to establish a diverse community. Plants shall be installed to a rate of plantings. Sorry, so some of these other subsections do reference planting Right, and I, I don't mean to worry it too much, but mm -hmm. I just in three, I'm wondering where's the affirmative obligation to plant? Because mm -hmm. if in F, in the main body, it said, and shall plant blah, 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 I'm sorry, but shall you know plant uh, in some form, then I understand the, you know, how the uh, two and three are qualified, but I just don't know what it's referring back to is my point. Okay. And so that's my question. I'll, do, I'll just, just note in here for the moment and then we'll, okay. as we go through, if we don't find it, we'll come back. Is there any, anything else on? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, this sort of leads to a question that came up, that came up last week. Um, but all of these things, we, in the submission requirements uh, are, are sort of confused back and forth as to what, there are some things in here that seem to be real submission requirements and other things are sort of conditions that are just dropped in here in some way. Um, and I'm wondering just, so they filed this plan, what is it that requires them to actually implement the plan? And, Maybe Mr. Haverty can just explain how the, the structure of, uh, of this works. I, I think we're all assuming that once they file the plan that these things are all commands and some of them are explicit commands, but, it's, but I'm not clear on exactly what it is that says you've got to follow all these plans. Mr. Chairman, the applicant is required to construct the project consistent with the plans approved by the board. So if the plans are submitted in compliance with this condition, then that requires the construction to be done in accordance with those plans. So the plans in that context means not just the plans that are listed under A2, but- The final of, plans. But all, oh, I see, okay, got it. Because remember, the, the plans that you guys are reviewing are preliminary plans and they're required to submit final plans before they can obtain building permits. Right. 
Okay. Was there anything else? I had gone, I had gotten a little confused about what was included in C1, what's included in C2, and I had gone through and tried to clean it up. And I noticed in C1, there were actually several items that appeared to maybe belong as sub headings under a separate item. Um, so that was, so under I, was other than site work and other, no other construction, if you shall commence, no building permits shall be issued under this comprehensive permit until the director of the staff has approved the final plans. Um, and just here, I everywhere it says building commissioner, I changed to director of inspectional services because of the that's the official title in the town of Arlington. Um, and then all of these here, the, what are now sub I, sub double I, sub triple I, sub, uh, sub IV, these were separate lines, but they all reference the final plans, which seems to be what this I is about. So I just was sort of reformatting them. So they all document about what the final plans are about. Um, and then there are a couple of ones. So this one, location of all utilities, uh, electric that should be shown on the final plans, all transformers and other electrical telecommunications shall be included in the final plans. So electrical, telephone and cable cables to the duplex buildings are not currently shown on the utility plan. Um, so I don't know if we need to reference that um, because it just says that you know, they, they'll need to be shown on the final plan. So I don't know if that's something that we're concerned about at this stage. The location of the cabling running to the main building are shown, but not to the individual duplex buildings. So is there a problem leaving it in? I mean, I just, you know, mm -hmm. why not? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Would it, would it help to, to say the location of all utilities to the duplex units and or the residential senior residential housing shall be limited just to make it clear up there in the first line. Say, look, it, all, of all utilities to all buildings. That's fair enough. And then this V I brought up, this was lower down, I believe is, um, so I brought it up here because again, it's it deals more with the final plans. Um, and originally was the applicant has proposed to use all electric for the project if any gas services to be used, the gas service location will be indicated. So the plans that were provided do show gas service to everything. Um, at the moment, and but we had affirmative commitments from the applicant to stay all electric. So I was proposing that we would say here the applicant has committed to using all electric for the for the project. If any gas service is to be provided for an emergency generator or other similar facility, gas service locations shall be included on the final plans. Seems fine to me. Yep. Could I raise one question that we may want to, um, you know, th there's there's probably nobody a more more vociferous advocate of the, the all electric than I am, mm -hmm. but I don't remember. And maybe somebody can help whether Gwen's commitment relating to using all electric was ever made in connection with the duplex units. Much of the discussion happened before the duplex units came back into the picture. And I remember at one point asking her whether the commitment was still good on the new plan, but in context, she easily might have, you know, had blinkers on and was thinking just about the senior residential building. Um, 
and I'm, I'm wondering if anyone has a recollection of anything that happened that that would shed any light on that. If not, maybe I should go back through the notes and and the and and find out the places where she said that. Although I may have, my notes are terrible, and 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 I'm probably more likely than practically anyone else to have written it down. But anyway, that's a it's an open question. It, it's clear that she intended, even with the senior housing, to use all electric, but it wasn't clear, as I remember it now, whether the commitment with respect to the new plan was broad enough to include the townhouses that there isn't any technical reason why it shouldn't but i don't know whether whether that's what she said or not okay well i'll leave this We can we'll come back to that. Um, this is the re relocation of the utility pole that's in the middle of the driveway between units three and four. Um, and then I also moved up the final plan shall include the sign elevations and details consistent with sign information shown in the approved plans, um, which we just had again as a separate item. Uh, applicant must notify the assessor's office, um, <clears throat> and then. So this is the first of the conditional conditions in regards to the, um, the conservation parcel. Um, so in the absence of a signed memorandum of understanding between the applicant and the town of Arlington, the applicant shall provide a report to the board indicating the extent of site cleanup operations and the cost of the cleanup operations to date. If there is a signed MOU, the terms of that MOU shall supersede this condition. Um, so essentially the the applicant had indicated they had allocated $100,000 or more to doing a first round cleanup of the site. Um, and so this is more just to provide the board before, you know, at the start of the project as to what they've accomplished so far. And obviously this, this is the first of several of these where if there is an MOU issued, then the terms of the MOU would supersede the, these terms. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, in the absence of the MOU, have we covered in this agreement someplace else that prior to construction, they need to do a site survey for environmental contamination on the total site? Yes. Prior? Yep. Okay. So, Thank so, you. so this section here, C1, um, is prior to any construction or site development activities. Um, so that's at the very, very start. And then I believe I put it under, I think that's under C2. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, is there anything prior to C2 we wanna review again? Seeing none. Um, <clears throat> Need a little extra space in there. We'll fix that. Um, so before the issuance of building permits, so they have to record the comprehensive permit, submit to the board and the director of planning community development evidence of a final approval from the subsidizing agency, submit a copy of the regulatory agreement and monitoring services agreement for the project, um, Submit to the Director of Inspectional Services, final architectural plans prepared, signed, and sealed by an architect. Uh, architectural submit in such form as the Director of Inspectional Services may request pursuant to state building code. Section E, submit to the Director of Inspectional Services and Director of Fire Prevention. <clears throat> Automatic sprinkler system plans conforming with NFPA 13 and the fire alarm system. And whoops, let me get rid of that A and fire alarm system plans conforming with NFPA 72 for the senior rental building. Both systems shall be designed to be monitored. Precision plan shall be submitted in such form as the director of inspection services, director of fire prevention may request personal to state building code. So uh, initially this was just that these plans, but 
this just sort of puts it in the same format as the prior statement about the building plans. Um, and then that's E, uh, obtain and file with the director of inspectional services, copy of all required federal, state, and local permits and approvals required to begin construction of the project. So G, um, let's obtain all necessary building electrical plumbing associated permits required to begin construction. But this is stuff that has to be completed before the issuance of a building permit. Um, so I don't know if it's an issue that this includes the word building. And so I'm not, I'm not sure if Paul, you have any experience in this. Um, is this sort of standard language or how does that typically get handled? Which language are you referring to, Mr. Chairman? So in G, it G? says obtain all necessary building electrical, but this is the C section C2 was things that needs to be accomplished before the issuance of a building permit. Mm -hmm. So sort of, we're sort of, if this is kind of nitpicky, but it sort of says- No, I, I understand. Um, I'm not sure where else you would put this. Okay. I mean, is it actually necessary to have it at all? It's not. I mean, they're bound by state law anyway. We can't correct. waive all of this. I'm, I'm not sure what the point of it is. The point of it really is just simply to make sure you're being as clear as possible in your decision, everything that's mm -hmm. necessary to do before they can move on to the next phase of the project. Mr. Chairman? But this doesn't have to be in there. Yes, Roger. Uh, I was just looking back at C and I just had a question. The copy of the regulatory agreement and monitoring services agreement. I'm not familiar with that tip of that type of uh, document. And I am, I'm assuming that it's something that is um, entered into or, or is this right? Is it entered into between the applicant and mass housing? Is that what that's about? That is correct. And and is that got to be final? It's got to be in final form. It's not going to be a temporary or provisional uh, type of arrangement. Would that also be true? Do you think, Paul? It it has to be not only finally executed, but actually the, the regulatory agreement has to be recorded. Okay. Prior to um, obtaining a building permit, it's all part of the final approval process with the okay. subsidizing agency. Um, all of which has to happen before they can build the permit. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't something that they could come back later and amend, you know, at will. So as long as it's going to be final, that's fine. Thanks. So back to G, should we leave this in or omit it? I don't think Mr. Chairman, I think you can take it out. I don't think there's any harm in having having it there unless people disagree. You feel strongly one way or another? I don't. <laughs> I mean, I would I would be happy to leave it in. Okay. Um All right. I don't think it hurts to leave it in either. Okay. Moving on to H, uh, applicant responsible for all applicable sewer permit capacity impact privilege fees is applicable, notwithstanding the following, the applicant should not be responsible for infiltration and, and inflow fees. This is pretty much exactly what we had done with um, 1165R. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, it's not quite. Uh, okay. Actually, I mean, I, 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 in a minute, I have a bigger question as to exactly what the difference is between the two. What what is contemplated as the all applicable water and sewer system fees, as opposed to all applicable sewer permit capacity impacts and privilege fees, because I mean, it, it, I'm sure that they're different in in some way, but I'm not completely clear. I understand exactly where the distinction is, mm -hmm. but in any event. While I think it, 
it's clear that uh, the II fees are not permitted. Uh, I don't recall that the other municipal fees that were not set forth in a published rule, regulation, or bylaw in existence at the time. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was in the other, mm -hmm. in the other, and I'm 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 wondering whether it was. I I thought I looked, but now I, I I've got so many different things on my screen, I, I can't readily <laughs> find it. So I guess by I would ask that question of Paul, that final clause, I mean, that's true whether it's in here or not, correct? Correct. It does not need to be in there. But it, taking it out doesn't make it any less accurate. Right. So knowing that, does it change how people feel about that? I, I I guess, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm happy. To, uh, not only am I happy, but there's nothing I can do about it. If I was unhappy with uh, letting the existing law just take its course, and in general, I feel nervous about attempting, particularly as, knowing as little as I do about what the underlying law is, uh, attempting to paraphrase it for fear that you're creating something here that wasn't already in the prevailing law. So right. if all we intend to do is to restate the rule that it would apply anyway, I would prefer not, not doing that in, in, in general, because at the, the best you can do is accurately state it, in which case you haven't really achieved anything. And the worst thing you can do is inaccurately state it, in which case you've created confusion. Understood. Um, <clears throat> and so again, that's the, pretty much the same issue um, here. This next one as well. The next one was actually one that that was got me thinking about this because it suggests that whatever the existing water and sewer system fees, meaning to a lay eye, the kind of sewer and water things that we pay twice a year or more, uh, that that's grandfathered forever in the condition it was back in 2016. And that, that seems like an odd result. And uh, so I'm guessing that the intent is that to apply them to something else. But I, when I got that far, I realized that I had no idea what any of this was about. And it was a little bit nervous sticking stuff we don't know about in here. Okay. Well, I can review it relative to the, the language in 1165R. I think it's pretty similar, except I'm not sure that the the or other municipal fees languages in there or in there in both positions. Okay. Need to take up the board's time. Let's see whether the applicant had whether it was entered in as a uh, by the applicant or not. Mr. Chairman, I have I've I've got the final opinion of, on the screen, yeah. and uh, I'm not I'm under it the H. It has notwithstanding anything contained herein, the applicant shall not be responsible to pay for inflow and infiltration fees, and the next one was responsible for all applicable water and sewer system fees. But then it says, as per officially promulgated fee schedules, uniformly applicable to all other town Arlington projects, notwithstanding anything contained herein, the applicant shall be not shall not be responsible to pay for inflow and in, inflow and infiltration fees. Okay, so both does those so in here, I think the second sentence on both of them was inserted was a recommended insertion by the applicant. Um, So we can either, if we're uncomfortable with you know, the last half of the sentence, we can, tip, we can certainly remove that. If we feel more comfortable with the language from 1165R, we could switch over to that as well for consistency. 
Yeah. Well, I I would be prepared to either get rid of it as if it, or to stick with the formulation we had in 1165R. Anybody feel strongly one way or another? No. I would go with the latter suggestion myself. To go back to 1165? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll agree with Mr. DuPont. And moving on, Jay, so they just revised stormwater report documenting any changes in the design that have occurred. Uh, K, applicants should perform additional test pits at the proposed stormwater basins to confirm groundwater elevation during seasonal high groundwater. Um, and then the calculations be the revised plans and stormwater calculations be provided to the Department of Planning and Community Development for review prior to building permits. To of building permits. Okay. Um, then this section L um, was kind of split. It had a couple different things. So this grading, um, I moved that down to I-19 because it deals more with stormwater and that kind of issues. And then the, the set aside here for 100,000, I moved down. So M. <clears throat> So Kevin, this is sort of this, this, the next yeah. phase here. Um, to the absence of a signed memorandum of understanding between the applicant and the town of Arlington regarding the final disposition of the conservation parcel, the applicant or its agents shall perform a phase one environmental assessment of all parcels consistent with the requirements of MGL C21E and EPA standards for phase one assessments. Copies of the report are be submitted to the board and the Department of Planning and Community Development. In addition, the applicant will place $100,000 in an escrow account under the control of the Department of Planning and Community Development to remove items identified in the report from the conservation parcel and dispose of them under state law. If there is assigned an MOU, the terms of that MOU shall supersede the condition. And then the next one, N, was in the absence of assigned MOU between the applicant and the town of Arlington regarding the final disposition of conservation parcel. Should the phase one environmental assessment indicate the possible at presence of oil or other hazardous waste on site, the applicant or its agents shall also perform a phase two environmental investigation of all parcels consistent with the requirements of MGLC 21E to identify oil or other hazardous waste in the soil or groundwater. Copies of the report will be submitted to the board and the Department of Planning and Community Development. The costs associated with the phase two environmental investigation and subsequent site cleanup shall be borne solely by the applicant. If there is a signed MOU, the terms of the MOU shall supersede this condition. Mr. Now, Chair? Yes. Uh, in the prior paragraph, the sentence, the applicant has agreed to the uh, terms outlined in finding number 71 above. Uh, I believe there was an objection to that uh, during our last night of public hearing where Ms. Kiefer was you know, fine to agree to conditions, but um, she considered the findings, opinions of the board and was basically um, hesitant to, you know, adopt them as mm -hmm. the board's opinion as a condition. Okay, yeah, so I was planning on striking um, the, the uh, so striking from it this, the applicant in the town of Arlington sign a mutually agreeable memorandum of understanding because we're basically we were conditioning that they had to sign it, which we can't do. Um, regarding the disposition of the conservation parcel, the applicant has agreed to the terms. So finding 71, I think it actually slipped to 73. 73 now. Um, but yeah, the, so I think what we have now would allow us to remove the original language um, because the, the language we're using now is a little, is more in keeping with, I think, what had been discussed um, mm -hmm. last hearing in regards to what was being considered for the MOU and what was being proposed. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. So that would mean deleting the language about agreeing to terms outlined in finding 71 and I, which is 73 and, and I'm guessing that I'm not so sure that we need to do anything. I mean, 
I don't know why we need to have a finding ultimately about what the applicable the applicant's proposal at any particular period of time mm -hmm. is um, and the language that you've read bef before and that i'm leaning over and struggling to read on the screen <laughs> is uh but it's more specific and and ultimately what we have to do here is to adopt something that can stand as conditions in case that memorandum of understanding just for some reason is not reached uh, and so I, I like the approach that that you've outlined here much better than talking about the applicant's proposal. So I stick with one and, and can the other. Thank you. Paul, do you see any issue with this approach? I think that works fine. Any questions, further questions on M and N? Yeah, Mr. Chairman? Um, I, my understanding is that the intent here is to use the word hazardous waste as it's used in the state statute. Um, but there are lots of ways of people may have of using that. And I wonder if, if, uh, we need to include a, a reference to the, the definition that we mean, uh, you know, it. I don't think it probably means anything that anybody in the public thinks might be hazardous. Uh, it's it's got a specific meaning under the uh, uh, under under the statute, Mr. Haverty. I wonder if you. Uh, th I'm, th th I'm, I'm raising my hand to you, amazing to you because you're more likely to know this than anyone else. Although it's not typical 41 B, 40 B law, but uh, what. What is the definition that is intended here? The, the definition that's intended regarding hazardous waste. Oh. I mean, there is definitions under Chapter Twenty One E, and I, I think that that's sort of what we would be relying upon. Yes, it's something that's determined to be hazardous waste as identified under the statutory scheme. That is chapter 21 e So would it make sense to just say hazardous waste within the meaning of section 21 e or something like that? Sure, that's fine. Yep. So we are requiring that phase one be done under consistent with the requirements of 21 e And then we do note here that should the phase one environmental assessment indicate the presence of oil or hazardous waste. So it, does sort of include that, but I can certainly add it here. Okay, I think it's as defined, but <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's belt and suspenders, but I th I think it's sort of helpful to to proclaim that. Okay, absolutely. Anything further on M and N? That's the end of C. Whoops! Hold on a second. Good to move on? Yes. All right. So section D, so it, there was a recommendation earlier to swap the original D and D because of the, just the, it sort of keeps things in more of a chronological order to do that. Um, so I have gone ahead and done that for the draft I have on my screen. Um, so the, these D's are what used to be the E's. Um, <clears throat> 
So prior to commencement of any work on the property, applicant and the site general contractor shall attend a pre-construction conference with representatives from the fire department, Department of Public Works, um, engineering planning, development, and other staffs may be determined. Um, and so I have, and then there was a, it included one from there, it went to the applicant and the site general contractor shall host a meeting open to all members of the public to review construction schedule, hours, policy, procedures. So the, I replaced that portion with this part here, which is from 1165R. Um, so the applicant and the site general contractor shall host a meeting open to all members of the public to review the construction schedule, hours, policies, procedures, and other neighborhood impacts at least 14 days prior to the start of construction. Written notice of the meeting shall be provided to parties of interest pursuant to, and I should probably make that MGL for clarity. MGL chapter 40A, section 11, at least 14 days prior to such meeting. Additionally, the applicant shall prepare a list of additional parties interested in notice and shall provide notice to such parties. So that's basically to make sure that the, that meeting is ap adequately advertised um, so that everyone has an opportunity to attend. Um, D2 is prior to the pre-construction conference. Applicant shall submit a construction management plan for administrative approval by the board. CMP shall be made available to those receiving notice of the meeting open to the public at least five days prior to such meeting. CMP shall provide documentation of various construction related activities, including. Um, and a schedule, logistics, site management, safety coordination. Um, and in coordination with the town to provide construction updates on projects website posting on dedicated and it, I sort of tried to merge this with what was for 1165 so uh, coordination with town to provide construction updates on projects website uh, posting on dedicated municipal website and email notification to registered email addresses so this will so I'm assuming that the projects website would be private would be by the applicant. Um, posting on a dedicated municipal website could be our web, our 1165R website, or excuse me, our Thorndike Place website. And then email notification to registered email addresses. So people who want to be, sign up and receive those email notices can do so. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Do we have, am I, has the applicant agreed to have a website? Um. They have one currently. Well, that's interesting. So I just, just so they have one currently that had sort of been updated to sort of talk about what they're doing and what the project includes. And so I had just sort of assumed that they would make, you know, that they would be maintaining that website going forward. Because I wonder whether it would be, make sense if, if we're relying on that to include a condition requiring them to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're certainly saying that we would be having our own website in addition to that. So they'll have, if they have their website, then we would have our, we, we would still be maintaining our website with this information and then email notifications. Mr. Chair? Yes, Stephen. Oh, um, on, during our October or September 9th, 2021, uh, you know, I do have a note of um, Ms. Kiefer saying that they would be amenable to doing a website to show a construction schedule. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you for that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I just have a question and it came to mind, uh, number four, site management, mm -hmm. noise mitigation, dust control. I happened to be talking to somebody uh, yesterday who in another town lived somewhere near a 40B. And during the course of construction, everybody on the street was actually using traps to catch rats. And, and I think I asked this question before, and I think it's probably been answered. But I'm, I'm just wondering, is that something that needs to be addressed in the agreement? Because I don't, or in the decision, I don't think it's 
in there specifically, or is it that the town itself has enough coverage in terms of whatever existing laws exist uh, that it would be taken care of anyway? Because I'm, I'm guessing that once construction starts, it's going to be quite an issue. And I didn't know how to address that, if at all, in the decision. So I believe there are there are sections that deal specific, excuse me, specifically with rodent control further down. Um, but let me just note. Yeah, I'm sorry if I missed them. I didn't. I I looked for pest and I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see it under any reference to pest when I did a word yeah. search. But perhaps it's under rodent. All right, we'll make sure it's there. Um, D3, this is the site observation, um, having an authorized representative of the board allowed to observe. Um, proposed construction shall be in accordance with applicable federal state laws, rules, and regulations, except where waived herein, the proposed construction shall be in accordance with applicable local laws, rules, and regulations. Uh, the standard site retaining walls, four feet or greater in height, have to be engineered. Uh, so prior to construction, this was one that had sort of gone back and forth, and this was an agreement between the applicant and the town that prior to construction, there will be a closed circuit TV sewer pipe inspection to be performed. And then um, the re any repairs that are required as the from the pre-inspection would be the responsibility of the town. And then at the end of the project, they'll go back and check it a second time, and anything that's changed is the responsibility of the applicant. Uh, D7, um, to instruct the applicant shall conform to all local, state, and federal laws, provide advance notice to abutters. And I just wanted to say abutters of the site and abutters to local public ways servicing the site. Um, and we may want to sort of think a little bit more about that, but I was bringing that up because it this does talk about um, blocking of town roads in order to accommodate deliveries. And so I think it's important not just that it be, you know, the, those right. residents that are just down in the neighborhood, but that anyone who is along that path ought to be kept aware as well. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Uh, I agree completely with that. But, but can, we, can we go back to the previous paragraph? Yes. Um, I, I noticed that it, whoops, at the end, it says the pipe shall be repaired, replaced at the expense of the applicant site contractor. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that that really should be the responsibility of the applicant. If the applicant wants to contract with the mm -hmm. site contractor to make the site contractor responsible, that's up to them. Right. But the applicant site contractor isn't before us and I don't really see how we can affect the right, his, its rights. <clears throat> That seems fair. <laughs> so in, in D7, I, the only thing I was concerned about was if I say local public ways servicing the site is the question of how far out that goes. Um, so I wasn't sure if I yeah. should say servicing the site south of Lake Street or whether we should, how, if we should worry about that being interpreted too broadly. I mean, I, I guess the precise, perhaps a precise way to do it would be to review the, um, you know, the turning diagrams submitted by the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where they showed delivery routes and, and, and such and, and name the actual streets. Um, you know, ways servicing the site, we're ways servicing the site. It's, we're really talking about um, the delivery of construction materials and construction vehicles. I'm trying to think of a way to say that. Reference just servicing the site from Lake Street. 
So it just streets in from Lake Street? Or is that too much? I think that's fair. Chairman, that that seems right to me that you want to exclude Lake Street, which at least is technically a street, local street servicing the site. Um, and while they're not primarily intending to use Wilson or Mary or whatever, uh, they might. And mm -hmm. people who live on those streets have an interest. And what's more is blockages on some streets will affect traffic on others. Right. So anything in that network between Margaret Street and Wilson Street and south of Lake Street should count, it seems to me. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we do include um, you know, the address is, um, I think particularly, I, I believe Mr. McKinnon and the Ides, you know, who are on the corner of Little John and Lake, that they are, you know, that, that this would include them. The word of butters basically does that, right? Because even though their address isn't on uh, Little John, they abut Little John. Right. Okay. Do we need to be concerned about the interpretation of provide advance notice to abutters? Yes, notice to abutters per the residential construction control. So basically what we're saying is they need to provide advanced notice per the town's residential construction control. Okay. Order. So I think that'll be okay. So that's D7. D8 shall not drive piles during construction. Um, Specify any methods of all subsurface compaction as part of the construction management plan. Applicants shall keep all portions of any public way used as access egress to the project reasonably free of soil, mud, or debris deposited due to use by construction vehicles associated with the project. Fairly boilerplate. Um, on D9. Um, so again, here it sort of talks about the final signage. So that's why I say we're here, refer to C1I. So it's, um, I've removed that from here and just, this is now just about temporary signage. So the temporary sign, including the name and address of the project, contact information for the applicant, general contractor, engineers, architect, and other relevant parties shall be posted at each construction entrance for the duration of construction operations. Sign must be legible and able to be read from Dorothy Road. Um, and that's, more in keeping with what we had done for 1165R. Um, this makes it easier to know where to look for the construction signage. Um, 10, so this is an exact duplicate of one of the other terms about the final plans. Of, so D10, I'm recommending we remove. Um, and D11, uh, I moved. And this is one we had discussed before. It's about the, this question about the gas service. Uh, D12, uh, it's about site lighting. Uh, D13, uh, so utilities including but not limited to telephone, electric, and cable shall to the greatest extent feasible be located underground. Um, to the greatest extent feasible was language we had adopted for 1165R. Currently, the drawings do indicate the telephone, electric, and cable service to the apartment building as being underground. But as I mentioned before, there's no reference to how it's being run to the duplex units. Um, so this here doesn't obligate those services to be underground, but does encourage them to the greatest extent feasible to have them be underground. Mr. Chairman? Yes. My recollection in 1165R, there was there was a reason why, I mean, because it had already been developed and it uh, had a complicated pattern of, of utility connections that we stuck in to the greatest extent feasible because we suspected that that there would be it would be possible that that something wouldn't be feasible. Mm -hmm. Um and I just wonder whether we need to have that qualification here that nobody, 
to my knowledge, has suggested that there would be any difficulty as far as feasibility is concerned of, of undergrounding the duplexes, and they've already done it with the with the senior housing. So I'm just asking my colleagues here whether we think that it's necessary to stick this qualification in. My, my concern was just that, so there's a pole, there'll be two poles along the project. There's one at the corner of Little John and Dorothy, and then there's a second one that'll, that'll be farther along Dorothy. Um, so they can run, so those three services are gonna be on that pole, so they can run them down underground there, but then they're gonna have to run across adjacent property. You know, they'll have to run you know, horizontally through that front yard. So it becomes where so now you've got an you have to establish an electrical easement for the maintenance of those services that doesn't currently exist. Mm -hmm. So that was my concern was just that okay. and we you know as, as to the best of my knowledge, we don't just for you know in the ordinary construction of duplexes, there's not a requirement for utilities to be run underground. Correct. And I'm certain that none of you know chances are that very few of the the buildings on these streets currently have underground services. Uh, D14 uh, was just changing building commissioner to director of inspectional services. Um, this one was verbatim in 1165R. Um, applicant shall test soil during construction, confirm soil types areas of the infiltration system. This session should be witnessed by the board's designee. Um, all unsuitable material, if any discovered, uh, that's fairly boilerplate. Um, so which brings us to D16. Um, so I know we had sort of gone back and forth about this. We had a, there was a lot of discussion about this with the, between the public and the applicant and the board at our last public hearing about the hours of operations. Um, so I know that the, there have been a discussion about changing 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Um, and then I know there was a lot of pressure to change the weekend hours and to possibly eliminate Sunday and holiday hours. Um, I want to sort of see where the board was on these. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I apologize actually for bringing this up. Um, the, but it seemed to me that the applicant, if it was prepared to agree to or at least live with giving up on Sundays and holidays, mm -hmm. um, if they could get a, do a little bit earlier um on on the week especially in the morning to get their to get their people there um the residents generally wanted to minimize the construction hour i mean if they could have gotten it down to the five minutes between twelve twenty-five and twelve thirty, i suspect that there would have been people advocating that um but it but people were really clear about sundays mm -hmm. and i'm wondering whether the the other thing that that I recall from the mix is that Ms. Noyes was um, primarily interested with being with getting her people there, and mm -hmm. not necessarily that interested in actually beginning to engage in the construction activities that would generate noise before um, seven thirty, so before eight o'clock. Um, but they would like to have some flexibility sort of as a price for agreeing not doing doing things on Sundays. Um, I don't know exactly where that goes. Uh, it's It seems, uh, and, and we may want to talk a little bit about it and, and think it through. Uh, you know, there is an advantage to having them quit by four. Uh, I suspect that during the winter, they'll quit by four anyway, because they need to clean up and get out, and get out of there before it gets dark. Uh, in the summer, it seemed odd to me that they would agree to, to, to not going a little bit later, but um, 
you know, moving things a little bit earlier takes the construction traffic more, uh, or takes the the access traffic more out of the peak hour, which would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, kids are going to school during all of these periods of time, but they'll be going to school just before eight o'clock, just as much as just before seven thirty. Um, so I had the sense that the thing that that tended to make the most people happy or, or least unhappy is cutting out Sundays and holidays and allowing for the 7.30 to 4 o'clock uh, on, on the weekdays. I'm not sure that leaves me with, I'm not sure what to do with Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's generally consistent with my recollection, but uh, I believe it was uh, 4.30 rather than 4.00. Okay. Having having the construction workers away from the site and not traveling during the during the period starting at four thirty is obviously going to be helpful when it comes to traffic. I don't know how big a deal that will make, but it will be somewhat somewhat helpful. We want to limit the Saturday hours. Yeah, I would suggest noon. I think that's fairly common. We stop at noon on Saturdays. So a, a noon start. Can they get a a full shift in at that point, or just, is it just basically a half shift? No, I think it's generally just a half shift. Not nine to one would be fine probably better to let people sleep in and give them a half day between nine and one, but I would limit it to a half day. Mr. Haverty, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if Mr. Yeah. Haverty, so what we've been talking about so far is kind of within the framework of that I thought that the applicant was more or less willing to agree to. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the hours that we have here are clearly not something that they were prepared to agree to. And I wonder if Mr. Haverty has a view as to um, as as to the validity or wisdom of 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 making this change on Saturdays. So if the imposition of a condition limiting the hours of construction is something that causes the applicant to take an appeal. Um, this condition would be stricken by the Housing Appeals Committee if it is not based upon a local rule or requirement that's applicable to unsubsidized housing development. So if this is the sort of requirement that is placed upon a standard um, housing construction site, then it would be allowed if it's the first time you've ever restricted the hours of, of a construction site to nine to, to one o'clock on a Saturday, then it, it doesn't even have to get to the point of determining that it renders the project uneconomic. It's what's known as unequal treatment and it's not allowed pursuant to general laws, chapter 40B, section 20. So I feel a little bit uneasy about pushing for you know outside what I think is more or less the what the applicant was willing to take as a trade-off here uh, the, the base rule I mean if we didn't we're fooling around essentially with the statute that prescribes the times and allows you know and and allows the work uh, on Saturdays um, and so you know I've I, I, if I had, if I had my druthers, and I'd do exactly what Mr. Uh, Ford suggested, but I'm a little afraid that 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 is going further than we can easily than we can easily justify, because we 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 wouldn't do this in general. We we we, as far as I know, we never have done this. I have a question. You know, we've had large developments like. Um... Arlington 360, and, and I don't know the rules and regulations well enough to know if we've restricted Saturday hours, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did. So I'd be curious, maybe it's a Mr. Dollarelli Chris question. Is that something that has been done? Is there precedence on other large construction projects in town for no half days on Saturdays and no Sundays? I may be catching him off guard here. 
I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Mr. Chairman, whether we can make that inquiry given that the hearing is closed. That is a very good question. Mr. Haverty, what's your assessment on that? I, I mean, I think that that would be really asking for the submittal of information that was not submitted during the course of the public hearing. So it's probably something that should be avoided. I mean, to Mr. Co Mr. Haverty's comment about unequal treatment, um, you know, there's the, at least my notes from the discussion of construction times with the applicant, uh, it mainly focused on weekday hours. I don't have any notes specifically about hours on weekend, mm -hmm. weekends, but 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. is what, I believe that is what we, you know, our noise bylaws um, limit hours of construction to. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the hours that were there originally, the eight to six and the nine to five, are taken straight from from Title Five. So, Mr. Chairman, I just I just to sort of lay this out, I raised the question originally whether, in order to reduce the impact on the neighborhood, that we ought to have these limits and ask people to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, the the community was strong, felt strongly about Sundays and I think holidays. And the applicant was sort of willing to do a quid pro quo that if they could start a bit earlier, they'd be willing to go along at least with the Sundays and holidays part. Um, if we did only that, then I think that, that it's fair that the record pretty much supports that. Uh, and I'm worried about going, going beyond that because it's, it's, I'm, for the obvious reason. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Mills. Yes, I have uh, an observation. First off, as far as limiting these uh, conditions on working hours on Saturdays, I think what is very different from this, from most construction sites, it's embedded in a very residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have lots of children and elderly and people trying to enjoy their lives in their neighborhoods. And they can tolerate it Monday through Friday, but the weekends and Saturdays, I don't feel bad about limiting them to a half a shift, as Mr. Ford suggested. And furthermore, I'd like to ask Mr. Valerelli, what are actually the codes in Arlington? What is allowed? Because I am have a funny feeling Saturday, Sundays and holidays are not allowed off the top of my head. But I'd like to ask Mr. Valerelli if possible. Mr. Mills, so the best of my knowledge, it's eight to six weekdays and nine to five Saturdays. This is um, for um, commercial commercial applications. If you're working on your own house, you can work on a Sunday. But to answer your question specifically for this project, um, they would be able to work from eight to six during the week, and I believe uh, nine to five on Saturday. But nothing on Sundays or holidays? No, to the best of my knowledge, I'm 95% sure nothing on Sundays or holidays unless they get special permission from the police department. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, is, is, is that part in the noise control ordinance too? So that's in the noise control ordinance, but it occurs to me, I don't know, I don't, know if the noise control ordinance has been amended since 2016 to change the the terms um certainly in the current version you know it reads a specific way um but i don't know if that you know if that was the same pri prior <laughs> Currently, town bylaws, Title Five, Sec Article Twelve, Maximum Sound Levels, Penalties, Matter of Enforcement, Application. Where is this? It's not the leaf blower numbers I'm looking for. It's the so it says prohibited times operating or permitting the operation of any of the following devices or vehicles before 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m. on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, or before 8 a.m. or after 6 p.m. on all other days. Okay. 
Does that have an exemption for working on your own house or is that, I mean, I'm wondering if that's the same provision that Mr. Valerelli is talking about. Okay, so this says the following acts are specifically pro, so this is section three daytime only activities, following acts are specifically prohibited operating or permitting the operation of any of the following devices outside of the times that are listed, uh, heavy equipment, electric, all electric motors, internal combustion engines, or other construction devices, tools, or equipment used in construction, drilling, demolition, maintenance, earth moving, including but not limited to bulldozers, backhoes, concrete mixers, dump trucks, pneumatic tools, rollers, scrapers, air compressors, generators, jackhammers, cranes, pavement breakers, pile drivers, rock drills, and chainsaws. So it's basically anything that you know, makes noise and there does not, looking at this, I do not see a specific exemption for homeowners versus other contractors. So I think that maybe the, uh, maybe a way of, of sort of getting beyond this and getting a little more done tonight is that we should table this and try to understand more what our, what we look at various bylaws and try to see exactly what the underlying legal picture is. Obviously, if there's some prohibition in some town bylaw that was applicable in, in 2016 to their working on Sundays, then presumably uh, we can do that whether they like it or not. But, uh, but we don't really know that. And, and, the, and I don't know that we need to take our own time now to do that. I'm willing to begin looking through that and, and see what I can see by reading through our statutes and, and, and report next time. Okay. Um, and then we, at, we had at 1165R, we had included the parking of all vehicles and equipment must be on the property directions. Yes. And Mr. Chairman, just to mention, Ms. Noyes specifically agreed with that okay. on the 20th. Perfect. Mr. Uh, yes. Before we move to 17, can we yep. go back to number B8 real quick? Um, I, had to go back to, I had to go back to my notes on that one. Sorry, D8? Correct. Yep. D8. Uh, um, so we, we're pretty confident they're not going to drive piles on this, right. but my notes from March 11th, uh, I believe we talked about it and it was written, but what, what I have written in here is um, the, the foundation work that they're planning to use is not piles, it's going to be ground improvement, and that's using, <clears throat> um, and that will cause vibrations. Okay. And so what, what the notes that I have in here, and I'll just read them, it says, it is not anticipated that the ground vibrations caused by the ground improvement um, will cause damage to nearby structures. However, due to the proximity of the adjacent buildings, it is recommended that the owner perform a pre-construction pre survey uh, of the adjacent buildings. And, and then I say, and then I wrote, um, there's some, there's some language that says, you know, the magnitude of vibrations may be sufficient in magnitude to cause cosmetic cracking. It is therefore is, is recommended that the maximum allowable peak particle velocity, i.e. the vibration level adjacent to the above grade existing buildings be limited to two inches per second above a frequency of 40 Hertz. 1.5 inch, inches per second uh, between 30 and 40 hertz, one inch per second between 20 and 30 hertz, and 0.5 inches per second below 20. These criteria are intended to reduce the probability of structural damage to the adjacent structures within generally acceptable levels. The threshold of human perception to vibration is well below these levels. It is recommended that the vibration monitoring with seismographs be performed by McPhail, who's the geotechnical engineer, during ground improvement installation. The point that I'm trying to say is I'm happy that we don't have to dwell on it here. I'm happy to craft it so that we can put it in here. But if the goal, it, I think I think we want to protect the neighbors from the, the vibrations that could cause some cosmetic damage. Driving piles isn't an issue on this one because they're not going to drive piles, but they are going to do ground improvement. And I think we, we do need to protect the neighbors by 
having the pre-construction survey done, and then providing general enough guidance where the geotechnical engineer will um, perform the seismographs and keep the uh, ground improvement operations within tolerable levels to try to protect the neighbors. So I can craft it so that we can put it in and edit this section, but I think it's a, if this is the place that we're we're talking about the foundation work and the vibration levels, then I think this section needs a little bit of work. No, absolutely. I know on 1165R, we had definitely included more about vibration um, than is included here in this paragraph. I don't recall where it was specifically in there, um, but if you could put, to, if you don't mind putting together notes on this, that would be helpful. So Mr. Chairman? Yes. I wonder if Mr. Ford could just just meant, say which day it was that that, that March, March, no... yeah uh, I have March eleventh, twenty twenty one. And if we stumble across um, other things about vibration, we can come back and discuss that as well. I just can't recall if it occurs elsewhere. Oh, but thank you for bringing that back up. Um, so this is 17 is more about um, site maintenance. Uh, I just want to add on site to be that you know, materials shall be stored or stockpiled on site so that they're not stored and stockpiled elsewhere. No building areas we left open unstabilized condition. 19, all dumpsters serving the project shall be enclosed and covered with the exception of construction dumpsters used during this. Um, the board shall review the dumpster location as part of the approval of the final plans. So they've been very clear that the dumpsters are going to be internal to the building. Um, and so they would be enclosed and covered for this requirement uh, with the exception of the construction dumpsters. So I think, I think this is fine as it is. Um, D20 is about retaining walls um, and it's just changing building commissioner to director of inspectional services. 21, snow. So snow should be stored with it. Within the areas of the property designated on the approved plans, the extent snowfall exceeds the capacity of the designated snow storage areas, the applicant shall truck excess snow off site. Snow may not be placed in or adjacent to resource areas. So the reason I flagged this is I know we had discussed prior snow that falls around the back side of the building, which is in the resource area, that as long as it is clean or meets uh, certain requirements from the um, that the Conservation Commission had put forward, they were okay with it remaining in or adjacent to resource areas. So I wasn't sure how we should address that here. Um, it what it may just be is snow may not be placed in or adjacent to resource areas except as um, outlined in and then give the section where we discuss that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Did. Uh, there's a distinction between we, between placing the snow in or adjacent to a resource area and leaving it there. And I'm wondering whether the Conservation Commission was really happy with having people with having them clear it from someplace else and put it in a resource area or whether they were just saying you didn't have to clean it or you could leave it where it is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the thought was that the the access way behind the building would have to be cleared. Yeah. So effectively there would be snow in the storage in the, I guess it's snow that is existing in the resource area would be moved within the resource area, but would not be moved to the resource area. Right. I'm just worried about the word placed, which suggests yeah. something more than that. Okay. Uh, perhaps we could say that snow may be plowed from the access road to the rear of the multifamily building or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Snow within the resource area.
section is. I think that definitely in section I somewhere, we'll find that. Uh, D22, um, no explanation of construction activities. Straightforward D23 applicant responsible for removing snow, sanding, internal roadways. The applicant is responsible for the sweeping removal of snow and sanding of the public sidewalk along Dorothy Road for local bylaws. That was one that um, our transportation planner had flagged as a question before. Let's clarify that. Uh, D24 maintain for all portions of any public road, whether state or local access to property free from soil and water debris. So we do mention soil and water debris somewhere else as well, but I don't think it's a problem to mention that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So as I was reading that, it just brought to mind the question as to uh, whether or not there would likely be any damage to the roads, especially you know the main road, Dorothy, mm -hmm. as a result of repeated uh, you know, construction traffic. And so I, I don't know, really, I don't recall what they said in terms of what the length of time the construction would take or how many vehicle trips there would be. I do know that they talked in terms of the number of, um, uh, what do you call them, the not components, but the mod modules. Boxes. Yeah, and, and it seemed like it was a fairly high number of trips. So I don't know whether those, str those streets are designed to be able to withstand that type of traffic. And so that raised the question in my mind about, well, what if it digs up the streets? And I don't know whether there's any general requirement within the town bylaws saying that if you do damage to streets, you're responsible for uh, you know, remediating the problem. Mm -hmm. So just a question. Sure. Hey, so I could ask Mr. Haverty, is that a condition that he's seen before? The addressing of damage by construction on public ways? I don't recall whether I've seen one that specifically required it, but it's certainly not problematic. I mean, mm -hmm. developers should be required to pay for any damage that they are shown to have caused. Okay. And certainly any you know, anytime they're going to be doing excavations in the streets and whatnot, they're going to have to go back and patch and repair all of that as well. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'm wondering when you think about all of this, whether, I mean, obviously the heavy vehicles on the street could, will cause potholes and things like that. And, um, but what I'm wondering, there's, there was testimony, as I recall, that there are various street trees that are that extend out into the right of way, uh, and I wonder if if the principle is that the applicant should be responsible for uh, fixing any damage that they do, uh, that that probably ought to include inadvertent damage to trees as well, and there may be other things that we haven't thought of that. Um, that will fall into the same category. And I, I, it seems to me that the principle that Mr. Haverty suggests that, that they should basically internalize the cost of the damage they do is the principle that it's fair for the town to impose on them. And the town owns the street trees as much as it owns the pavement. Um, and again, I, there may be other things I'm not thinking of that fall into the same category, but I'd like, I'd like to be broad, as broad as the principle permits. Okay. All right, so we can do some further work on that one. <clears throat> D25 is about <clears throat> permits for curb cuts. Uh, D26, um, the earth removal plan. Um, and then at 1165, we had included a copy of the plan will be kept on file at the job site. We're just adding that. Um, 
And prior to commencing any earth removal, the applicant shall provide the board with the results of a phase one site assessment pursuant to MGL 21E, which they should have done anyways um, under the prior conditions. Um, all catch basins, shovel oil water separators as shown on the plans. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Sorry, uh, just to go back to D24. Um, so regarding one, just uh, perhaps make an, making a note of this to look at later, uh, but uh, Title Three, Sections 1 and 2 of the Town Bylaws uh, deals with you know, construction in public ways and bonding. Uh, the applicant requested a waiver from this. I believe it was a waiver for request number one, in which we denied. Okay. So th there may be there may be coverage for this. Got it. Okay. But we should check. <laughs> All right. Severus um, D twenty nine. Um, the sidewalks and pathways, walkways shall be compliant with the requirements, of the ADA and the AAB, um, and then D thirty. Comprehensive permits, master permit issued in lieu of all others, and just here it was just changing building to um, inspectional services department. That was all of D. So I have a couple things there to come back for, but not too too much. Um, section E, which was prior section D, um, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for any structure, the applicant shall. Um, submit engineers interim certification of compliance with the utilities plan and profiles for such phases applicable to the director of inspection services. Write a letter to the board signed by the civil engineer certifying structure and supporting infrastructure has been constructed in appliance with the final plan. Gain acceptance from the fire department of testing of all fire protection systems, fire alarm systems, fire sprinkler systems, local smoke alarms, sewer connection sign offs. Um, submit a request for legal addresses for all new buildings from the engineering division, the public works department. Um, and Mr. Then, Chairman? Yes. Going back to the inspectors signed off by the fire department, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Um, can we add something along the lines of adequate site access to the um, larger building? Because the fire department approves they have adequate access. Um, yeah, that would not be within the dwelling units. So let's change it. Yeah, it doesn't involve the other six, but the major. the shorthand for the moment. Yeah, you get the idea. Okay. That, uh, and then F and the, again, this is the last section of the, of the MOU conditional conditions. In the absence of a signed memorandum of understanding between the applicant and the town of Arlington regarding the final disposition of the conservation parcel, the applicant Dorsey an agreement to provide an annual contribution of $25,000 to an escrow account under the control of the Department of Planning and Community Development for a period of 10 years for improvement slash maintenance of the conservation parcel for passive recreation by residents of the town of Arlington. If there is a signed MOU, the terms of that MOU shall supersede this condition. And so that was the last of the monetary stuff that the applicant had agreed to in the hearings. Mr. Chair, yes, this is sort of a broader question, but um, condition E1 is a contains a list of things uh, require or, or a list of things that are required prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for any structure. Yep. And E2 contains a list of requirements that have to be satisfied prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy for the project. Yeah. And I'm wondering. So I just, and I'm, it's just because I'm a little unclear about this. Do we phase certificates of occupancy? Um, so the, the inspectors, the building inspector can issue temporary certificates of occupancy. Um, 
prior of a, the final certificate of occupancy. So, and then they can, they would be able to, I believe, issue certificate of, like the certificate of occupancy for the apartment building is gonna be harder to achieve than the certificate of occupancy for the duplex buildings. Um, and so it's possible that like the duplex buildings will, could be, have their CFOs issued earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and, or they may issue, you know, they may try to get a few of them, get the CFOs issued so that they can sell them and get the, you know, for, get the money flowing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, E1 is really there for, you know, before anything gets permitted and then E2, you know, gets a certificate and then E2 is really before the final, final CFO. Oh, okay. Okay. I see. Is what we need to do. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you for the clarification. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I wonder if it would be clearer if if we said pr something along the lines of prior tuitions of the final certificate of occupancy or possibly the, the final one for the project as a whole or some, some such thing because some people reading this, including me until just now, were not clear on what the distinction was. Look for digital files in digital format. So just both getting things in AutoCAD format and as in PDF, and then CAD delivery shall include the information they had requested. Um, I had added subsurface features and flood boundaries, which were not included in the original. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't think that there is any provision for a final certificate of occupancy for an entire project. I think it's based upon structure. Oh, okay. So, the way that I read these, and I intention, you know, I originally drafted them, so that's what my intent was, at least. Um, E1 really addresses COs per structure. Mm -hmm. means that all of these have to be completed for any particular structure that's seeking a CO. Whereas E2, and I, I didn't add subsection B, but E2 is something that's supposed to be applicable before any certificate of occupancy for any structure. Ah, uh, the opposite. Ah, yes. okay. Uh, although looking at this again, they may not have final as built plans. This really should say before the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy for the project. Because that's when you're going to get the final as built plans. I see. Okay. But subsection B doesn't really tie into that. First one will say prior to the issuance of any certificate of occupancy for any structure. Right. And then the second would be the prior to the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy. Right. Correct. Okay. And I would actually just take subsection B out and maybe make it E3. Where would you where would you install it? I would just make it E3 rather than E2 subsection B. Ah, okay. Can I just scoot it over? F traffic, <laughs> traffic safety conditions and sidewalks, uh, access and egress to the projects will be via Dorothy Road and or Little John Street consistent with the approved plans. 
Uh, operator of the senior living is required to include within its vendor contracts requirements of vendors. Um, so this is the question, the smaller delivery trucks. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to make it more descriptive. So small non-articulated delivery vehicles would sort of be, you know, small straight trucks, nothing that, you know, would be a two-part truck. Uh, so no 18 wheelers, no, yeah, sort of things along those sizes. Um, operator shall use all reasonable efforts to schedule vendor deliveries during off-peak hours. Vendors are to adhere to all local traffic requirements. And that's basically just to reiterate the, the, all the signs about when you can access certain streets. If, um, if there's no objection, um, after non-articulated vehicles, perhaps uh, say, i.e., no tractor trailers, <laughs> just to make it really clear. Yeah. Do we want to? Like, I was struggling with like weight limits and length limits, and there just does, doesn't seem to be a right. Yeah, I mean, I thought of weight limits and the number of axles. But. How's that? I think that's good. That's so good. Uh, senior living residents will own or lease a van to provide complimentary jitney service to the senior living residents and staff available seven days a week to provide access to and from MBTA and other local destinations. Service shall operate on demand and for such sufficient operating hours to provide reliable transportation service for residents and staff. So I, in, in the last hearing, their original thought was that it might run for four and a half hours a day, which just is not sufficient. And we had pointed that out to them at the time that that was insufficient. Um, and you know they had agreed to look into to longer hours. So I was sort of struggling to figure out how we could, you know, what we could put in. Um, and I was curious if you know what people think about this language for the hours. Because really the reason what we really want the Jitney service to do is to reduce the demand for cars and to, and for taxi rides and for you know Uber and Lyft. So it really need, if it's not providing a reliable transportation service, then it's not really working. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I think you have to distinguish here between the transportation service that's being provided and the utility of the jitney in avoiding parking requirements. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you take on demand to its logical conclusion, it's on demand the way Uber is on demand. It doesn't re reduce the number of auto trips at all. Uh, mm -hmm. It does mean you don't have to have your own car, so you don't have to put it in the parking lot, but you've got the same number of trips coming in and out uh, that you had before. You, you might actually even have more. Um, so making it on demand sort of cuts against the transportation advantage of the jitney service okay e except that you know it, by anything that makes it easier to get to alewife means that somebody isn't going to be driving in from from worcester or someplace so uh you know it has that effect but to the residents not so much mm -hmm. um so i just i'm not quite sure what to, to make of that but i think that we should not be uh overly enthusiastic about the jitney service if, if it were a regular bus service where people would would uh where a number of people would get on at one time uh it would have a bigger effect well, that's a good question is should it be operate on demand or set schedule <clears throat> mr chairman yes sir I would see this being more efficient if it was a 
a set schedule and be sensitive to the needs that a lot of these seniors are going to be needing to get to possibly public transportation for medical uh, appointments. And they can certainly schedule the, their medical appointments towards the middle of the day. But I would say a schedule that would include, say, a route that hit several common shopping areas, say Mass Avenue in the location of Capitol Square, and then goes up to Alwife, can pick up and drop people off, maybe over to Belmont Center and uh, back to Alton Center and come back to the site down Mass Avenue. I could see a loop like that mm -hmm. occurring, I don't know, five, six times a day at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's about a five-mile loop just off the top of my head, a six-mile loop. Now, Mr. Chair, I I would actually like to – I would be more comfortable striking the words or on-demand or set schedule um, and just stating the, the sort of functional goal of to provide reliable transportation service for residents or staff because I, I think it's – quite possible that you know the needs of residents or staff could change over time in ways that we're not necessarily thinking of right now. Well, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, maybe it would maybe it would be helpful it, it, the sent the sentence the way it's written now focuses entirely on operating hours. Mm -hmm. And what we also want to do is have them be considering mode of operation or mode of operation, i.e. on demand or scheduled service uh, in order to at least attract their attention to the issue, because otherwise they won't pay attention to the issue at all. They're just going to do it just the way they always were planning on doing it. Um, and there's nothing in here that would force them even to think about doing it in a different way. Do you recommend keeping those in? Well, I, you know, you could say, or for hours, or I, what I was actually thinking of is is saying for uh, operating hours and mode, for such sufficient operating hours and mode of operation, and then parentheses, i.e., on demand or set schedule, in parentheses, so that so that it's all said there. What was that again? So the service shall. I was going to say that for such sufficient operating hours and mode of operation, and then and then explain mode of operation with the parenthetical phrase uh, on on demand or set schedule. like that so i wonder if as long as i'm on a roll here if we could may include to provide reliable transportation service uh, and effective demand management or something of that kind because part of the point is not just providing reliable service i mean uber does that part of it is to uh, attempt to reduce the number of trips that are necessary That? Yes, I think so. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. How are we gonna have how are we gonna be able to ascertain that this service as they uh, implement it actually does meet these requirements? I mean it's, it's nice to make mm -hmm. suggestions for requirements. But I don't see any backbone of how we would actually monitor to actually see it is functional. It is meeting its design goal of reducing traffic. I'm just posing the question. I don't have an answer. Not a good question. Is that, I mean, is that something we should request some monitoring of? What I'm also suggesting is 
uh, hearkening to Mr. Revelak's comment that we really don't know the situation. Is this something that we can um, uh, control or change the conditions of later on that they can report back to the board and we can monitor how things are going and possibly enforce some later changes or work with them to define a more, you know, once we actually see how many people are coming back at what time, it may say, oh, well, then there should be a couple of schedule runs here. So people officially know they're going to be picked up if they take this train and they get the way for this time that the jitney is going to be there waiting for them. You know, right. they just, you know, I mean, I think some kind of schedule needs to be in place. Oh. And then we need to see if anybody's actually using this. And if they're not, how we can improve what they're doing. Right. I mean, these are all questions. I mean, I really feel for the neighbors in the traffic situation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know at, at 1165, we had included that the the management company would, because they were sort of trying to allocate their parking between, you know, between guests and the residents and the work bar. And so we had said, you know, quarterly, they need to evaluate that allocation and go back and reallocate it. Um, and so I had, I had sort of added in, when we get down to it about the parking that I included similar language here because I'm a little concerned that they would, you know, the possibility of selling too many parking spaces and then not having enough parking remaining for staff. And mm -hmm. um, so, I'm, you know, that is something we could consider here too of saying that, you know, they should, you know, how do we encourage them to, because I, I don't think it should be the board that is you know, constantly telling them they need to redo their jitney service. But how do we include something in here that, you know, can sort of be self-perpetuating on their end that they need to be, um, you know, providing, they need to be evaluating their, the service they're providing and making sure that it meets the needs of their residents and staff. Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm not so sure that we that there's much need to worry. The meeting the needs of their residents is something that mm -hmm. they are probably going to be wanting to do anyway. Um, if they if they're mm -hmm. thinking about it, um, we, we, it's unfortunately a little late in the game for us to be thinking about this because when the the place where it comes up a lot is going to be an access from staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you're going to want to be, your aim is to incur, this is in addition to a residence, it's an employment center. Right. And just like a commercial office building, it attracts traffic. And what we want is, this is, is to, for this to operate as a TDM to reduce the number of automobile trips that happen because making it easy to get from the subway station to the premises um, is one way of doing that. And if we were thinking of it in that way, there's probably a process that's already in place where the Department of Planning and Community Development follow these things along and ask for monitoring and uh, work with the applicant if, if certain standards aren't met. And I think that one of the problems we have is that when you're at the point where you're not even sure whether you prefer on demand or scheduled service, it's a little hard to, to define what the criteria are that somebody is going to look at to see whether or not um, whether or not it, it, it's working to reduce traffic. And like Mr. Mills, I don't really actually have an answer to that. Uh, the tra the condition as it is is more or less unenforceable and is really primarily aimed at making sure that people think about it. Um, but I, without knowing, without being able even to resolve for ourselves whether we think it's better to have on demand or a set schedule, mm -hmm. how are we going to how are we are we going to make this enforceable by establishing enforceable conditions? No, that's a good question. Very good question. I mean, Chairman. really, the oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say, in terms of enforceability, the I mean, really, the first sentence that's I mean, that's something that I, I think is you can you can put down as a as a as a require 
you can say that's a requirement that has or hasn't been met. Um, you know, the, the last three lines are much squishier, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Sorry, go ahead. Pop, so, go ahead, Mr. DuPont. Um, so it also uh, caused me to think when I read the first sentence where it prescribes that they will own or lease a van. I'm, I'm wondering if they necessarily have to be the parties to actually own or lease the van and provide you know, the drivers and all of that themselves. And the reason I say that is I was at Alewife today dropping off my son and I noticed that they had these you know, 128 you know, vans bringing people from, you know, different companies around the area to Alewife. And I'm, I'm wondering if in the long run, it might be better for them to enter into an agreement with some sort of a carrier to provide that service. You know, somebody who is, mm -hmm. who knows what they're doing. And so I wouldn't necessarily prescribe that over the other option but you might want to include that they'll own or lease a van or enter into a contract with a, you know, a carrier to provide complimentary jetney service. Because I, I just wonder if these people are equipped and experienced mm -hmm. enough to be able to actually do that themselves. Well, they were, I mean, I thought they were fairly adamant during our dis discussions that they were, it was going to be their own van. Okay. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, in the future, if they, wanted to switch to, you know, a, a more of a management model or something and, or leasing from somebody else, then they could, um, you know, request uh, a change, you know, a change from the board. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Steve. I was going to say, it, I mean, you, I think you could, miss, it may be possible to address Mr. DuPont's uh, point by just simply saying the senior living residents will provide complimentary Disney service. Right. That gives them the flexibility to do it however. however. Sounds so, good. So, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, one thing I think we should look, there was, there was an interchange between Beta and the applicant uh where beta relied on the fact that now i've now forgotten exactly what it was that beta was concerned about but it it it, it had to do well i've forgotten what it was but whatever it was the they the assurance that the operator of the senior residence would be using its own equipment uh was something that led beta to back off whatever it's point was and i can remember where the correspondence was but as is always the case i can't remember exactly what it was about but i just wanted to raise that that this is something that was addressed in the record between us mm -hmm. and we ought to just check and make sure that we're not inadvertently giving away something that uh, that we ought not to but that being said i think that i mean i don't see any reason why we should i don't understand why we should care whether they own or lease it, subject to whatever beta says to the contrary. And if there's no reason to regulate it, then there's no reason to ask somebody to come back for an amendment to the permit. We should just give them the flexibility. Ease. All right. Let's we'll see if we can. Was that something that you think came up in a meeting or was it something that was in correspondence? It was in the correspondence. It was the back and forth on comments. Okay. It was T something or other. And it and it and as I recall, it was in the comments that were exchanged in August. Okay. All right. We'll we'll, we'll can try to find that. Um, F4 is about emergency vehicle access. Uh, F5 should provide 28 long-term bike parking spaces that are covered and secure, and then they'll provide up to eight additional. And then, as we had done at Love Six Five, the bicycle storage fixtures requiring the lifting of a bicycle off the ground shall be provided with mechanical lift assistance. And this is specifically if they want to install two-tier fixtures because they find they need more space, then they can do that, but they need to have some kind of mechanical assistance. Um, and then the applicant should provide two outdoor short-term bike parking racks, each capable of parking up to six bicycles. Uh, parking racks should be in the approximate areas shown on the approved plans near the main entrance. 
And this bike rack shall be capable of securing a standard bike frame and one wheel using common U-type security lock without the need to remove either wheel. Just to make it a little clear, so what's a, what is an acceptable type of temporary rack? Um, the applicant shall provide new residents with transportation information packets, including but not limited to the following information. So um, originally it was just information packets with information on getting around Arlington sustainably, but I think it's important to information of getting around Arlington sustainably, information regarding the existing weekday peak hour turn restrictions from Lake Street onto Wilson, Little John and Homestead, information regarding local parking requirements and bylaws, information on the Jitney service, information on the Council of Aging sh shuttle service, information on the Minuteman commuter bikeway, information on the MBTA and pass services. Is there anything else that people think should be included in this packet? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I would say information about on getting around Arlington and, and surrounding communities sustainably. These people are living really close to Belmont, really close to Cambridge. A lot of the, you know, the, technically the way it's written would mean that they wouldn't have to give any information on how to get to the Whole Foods and Fresh Pond. And even more, they wouldn't be able to get to Iggy's store and on Fawcett. Yep. Um, so uh, there's that. Um, and I wonder whether we shouldn't be a little vaguer about, I mean, in 10 years, we it may very well be that the existing weekday peak hour restrictions are different from the way they are now. And we'd want the information to be accurate given whatever the circumstances were at the time the information is given. Um, and it may be that there's peak hour return restrictions on other streets than this, uh, hmm. where they, you know, generally whatever the restrictions are, they should be given the information as to what they are. And we shouldn't be so specific in tying it into to what the current restrictions are. So maybe just ending it at Lake Street? Or from Lake Street, yeah. Or yeah. Restrict, sure, restrictions from Lake Street and then remove everything after. Yeah, I think that, that would do for me, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else on this one? Uh, F8, it, uh, 95 parking spaces. Um, just cleaning up the way we handle numbers, uh, two handicap spaces, meeting the requirements of the ADA and AAB. Parking senior residents have a traditional monthly fee at market rates separate from rent in order to discourage motor vehicle ownership in the project. Um, I don't think we included anything specific. I'm pretty sure this is the language in the final 1165R. I know we had discussed whether, you know, how this applies to uh, units that are affordable um, and I believe, Mr. Havity, you had said before that the, in that case, it would still be under the restriction to not exceed 30% of the, of the of their income. Is that correct? Or 30% of the 80%? Uh, mute first, sorry. The <laughs> affordability is based upon uh, somebody uh, qualifying at no more than 80% of area median income spending not more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, the, the units will be required to be affordable in perpetuity so long as the, the project doesn't comply with the underlying zone, irrespective of whether any uh, other restrictions expire. But as far as uh, renting a parking space. It has to be, it's part of the calculation. Okay, good. Okay. So they, they factor in all of the costs of renting the space. Okay. So what it would do is it would basically drive down the allowable rent in order to allow them to purchase or, or rent the space. Okay. Great. Uh, F10, it's about the electric vehicle charging. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. 
to Mr. Hanlon's point about what might things might be like in 10 years, do you want to say in F10 before 10 garage parking spaces in addition, 10 additional at least? So it's not a cap. So uh, stations for at least 10 garage parking spaces where it first is. Instead of up to at least? Well, in the first section where it says for 10 garage parking spaces, do you want to say at least 10 garage parking spaces? Provide wearing embers is needed to allow for an expansion of the up to say and at least. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, good. Um, so the first part of F11 was originally as was moved and put into that tenant information package. Um, the parking for residents, staff, and guests of the senior residence building is to be accommodated primarily on site. The property manager shall review requests for parking quarterly and shall adjust parking space allocations as required to properly allocate available parking between residents, staff, and guests to minimize impacts on the adjacent neighborhood. Um, so obviously, we can't tell them that people can't park on the street because it's a public way. But I think we want to emphasize to the applicant that you know that they have said they can that the parking that they are providing meets their requirements, and you know Beta has concurred, and so I just want to make sure that we're saying to them, you know, you need to be keeping an eye on this, and if it's a problem, you need to do something to address it. And I know that they have specifically said, you know, if we find we need more parking, we can you know, we have available land on the site that we were going to be doing as sort of you know outdoor recreation space we could convert that into additional surface parking if required um but i was sort of proposing this as a way to sort of start that conversation and i just wanted to see what people thought about this approach mr chairman um there's no overnight parking there i assume correct on those public ways that is correct. Is that something we want to put in the informational material to residents that there's no overnight parking on the public streets? Um, so it did say information regarding local parking requirements and bylaws. Okay. So hopefully that would cover it. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, I would include something like including without limitation, the famous lawyerly words, <laughs> uh, overnight parking restrictions, because people don't assume that those exist. And I have just in other circumstances heard a whole lot of stories where people rent apartments and then they discover and they then discovered the overnight parking. They, they, they were never told. So uh, it, it might be useful to draw attention to that without being overly specific because the town may change it at some point. What was your lawyerly? Oh, including without limitation restrictions and overnight parking. Like that? Yep. Okay. Limitations or limitation? Sorry. <laughs> well, right now it's a limitation, but I'm not so sure that if you went, if you went out further, that it wouldn't be a more complex picture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a town meeting can do lots of things and parking is something that it's interested in doing. So I'm not 100%, and obviously the parking restrictions as themselves are a select board sort of thing. So I wasn't, the reason I chose the word restrictions is that it might be, there might be exceptions, for example, for certain kinds of housing. I think we'll see pr proposals this next town meeting for something like that. Um, and I just wanted to be broad enough to include whatever, you know, to include whatever may be adopted eventually.
Ready to move on to G. It is 943. <clears throat> um, G is not very long. There is something we would possibly want to discuss. So I wasn't quite sure if you wanted to stop here for tonight or if you wanted to go on for a little bit longer. I'm good. Well, let's finish up G. Okay. Yeah. Police fire emergency medical conditions. <clears throat> um, applicants shall provide professional senior housing operator property management and maintenance personnel on the premises during typical business hours and provide an emergency contact name and number for tenants in the Arlington Police Department. This thing property was in the wrong place originally. Need another verb. Uh, it's a G2 is one we've <clears throat> discussed several, several times, but stairwells and garages must be a minimum two hour fire rated and residential units must be a minimum one hour fire rated or as required by state building code. That should hopefully cover everyone's concerns about that requirement. Uh, four story residential structure shall be fully sprinklered per NFPA and state fire code regulations. Uh, compliance with all state building code and NFPA requirements related to fire access, safety and egress shall be met. Um, all elevators must have emergency generator, oops, or battery, what did it just do? Or battery backup per state elevator code. And I, I remember there was a question on 1165, I think it had said generator and they said change it to battery because we're going to do a battery, but we'll just leave that either way here. Uh, Project shall provide and maintain fire access sufficient to comply with applicable state building codes. Project shall provide adequate external lighting. That should be not external, but exterior. In front of the requirements of local regulations and outdoor codes. So we do sort of have that in here now twice. Um, as proposed by the applicant, the project shall have an access system and shall have staff on site to address security concerns of the police department. So this was from the original um, where they were going to have card access and somebody at the door all the time. And then now that it's this that we were sort of discussing, well, are you, know, are you even going to have to have a card swipe to get into the garage or to get into the elevators from the garage? Um, and so all this sort of security side of things, I think was, you know, they had indicated they were gonna do things, but I don't think we had a specific commitment for a specific course of action. Um, so I wasn't sure how specific we should necessarily be, um, except that they need to control access. So I, Mr. Chair, I would suggest uh, changing access system to access control system. But otherwise, I, I think that, you know, gets to the, you know, what you're trying to provide without being prescriptive in how it's provided. Okay. So if we just reduce it to that, Project shall have an access control system and shall have staff on site to address security concerns with the police department. Let's leave it at such. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. What exactly do we mean by staff on site to address security concerns with the police department? I mean, is there supposed to be someone there 24 hours a day on site to do this? Or, I mean, what I'm not quite sure what we're envisioning here. I guess that is, sorry, go ahead. What, that is how I interpreted it as there will be at least, there would be at least one staff person on site at all times. But it doesn't have to be a professional senior housing person because those people only have to be there during normal business hours. Right. I think like you would want to have somebody on site so that if, you know, somebody, if a resident locks themselves out, that somebody can let them in. Well, I don't think that G8 is addressing that. It's addressing security concerns with the police department. Okay. And if the problem is merely calling the police, I'm not quite sure why they necessarily have to be on site. So it could say she'll have staff on site to address 
um, access and security concerns, period. Ouch. Yeah, that would be fine. As I was reading this, I was also thinking, well, maybe the concern is the police department's concern and the, the, the person on site is supposed to be doing something because the police department tells them to or something like that. It's a little vague. Okay. I like that. Uh, G9, during times of construction, the project, including all structures, shall be accessible to fire department and other emergency vehicles. Additionally, all hydrants shall be operational in accordance with NFPA, standpipes and operational on each floor during construction as required by building code in the fire department. Uh, and then G10, the applicant shall consult with the fire department prior to the commencement of construction to provide an on-site emergency plan, which shall be updated as necessary throughout the construction process. Is there anything else in regards to police, fire, or emergency medical conditions? I'd love to say that, you know, emergency vehicles can't use their, or should not use their sirens when approaching the building, um, but that's operational within the fire department. That's not something we can condition. In my own experience. Oh, go ahead. No, Steve. Go ahead. I was going to say, in my own experience, um, you know, the fire, our emergency services are generally pretty good about not uh, turning on sirens when they don't need to. <laughs> good. Right. I think that's true. Okay. All right. So that brings us to the end of section G. Um, it's nine fifty, so we can stop here. Um, before we get to water and sewer, um, obviously section after that is wetlands, floodplain, environmental concerns. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to it. And then J is the next one, which is just other general conditions, which is much more sort of regulatory um, than anything else. And then we're done with conditions. And then we can move on to uh, reviewing the findings. Mr. Chairman, in light of you know Mr. Dupont's suggestion earlier on that we should avoid going too late, it's now mm -hmm. ten minutes to ten, yeah. and uh, while we might be able to do this really reasonably quickly, we'll be quick about it tonight or tomorrow night too. And I think two and a half hours is long enough. Mm -hmm. I concur. Okay. So we would be picking up next time with H. Um, and so the, and save this, Oops, where'd you go? Here, today's 11.3. Okay, so just had our November 3rd, so our next um, date, November 9th, next Tuesday, we have uh, two hearings. Um, so Thursday the 11th is the when we would be continuing deliberation. When we had set these dates, I it had kind of slipped my mind that, of course, November 11th is Armistice Day and Veterans Day, and I don't know if that poses any concerns or issues for anybody in terms of making it, having a meeting that evening? So seeing none. Um, I would, if I could have a motion to continue tonight's deliberations until Thursday, November 11th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. One second. second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Rourke. 
Aye. Mr. Black? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And chair votes aye. So we are continued until the 11th. Um, and then just look at, just back at the calendar. Uh, so then we would be trying to finish on the 16th if possible. Um, if not, we'll have to consider whether we want to try to squeeze in some extra time. Obviously the 23rd is already pretty booked um, and the 25th is Thanksgiving. So we would need to figure out how we want to address that. Um, but we can discuss that at the meeting on the 11th because uh, I think that'll give us sufficient time if we need, if we think we're, we're going to need to um, either try to fit another meeting in or really take advantage of the, the 30th uh, for the final meeting. So um, that is our calendar. Anything further tonight? Well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting and especially wish to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee and Kelly Lanema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. To conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Mr. Hanlon, a second? Second. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelac. Aye. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Paul, thank you so much. Good night, Mr. Chairman. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night, Good night guys. Good night, gentlemen.